Changing the world. When I grow up, I want to change the world. I'm sure you've heard that before. Or someone say something of a similar manner. Maybe even you've said something along these lines. When people say this, what do they mean? Do they want to make it better? Or would they simply want to mould it in an image that they deem to be more preferable? Or what about the scale? How much of the world do you want to change? All of it? Some of it? Parts of it? It might just be that our definitions of such are different. You could mean shifting someone's world, growing from something a bit more absolute to something a bit more subjective and relative. Either or, in most cases, it's founded in goodness and compassion rather than something spiteful or dark, unless one's aims are perceived as such. A man can be a hero in his own eyes, but a villain in others. I'm sure this was the case for many rulers in history, which we deem to be malevolent. Hitler was seen as a hero by many of the Germans after World War I, as he provided many solutions to many of the economic problems at the time, giving Germans both bread and work, especially to those who were anti-Semitic and, and brought the same philosophy of eugenics to create an ethnically pure race. But those who were against him deemed him to commit crimes against humanity. The same notion is present in animes like Naruto where Madara sought to create a perfect world and change it in his own way. He truly believed that his methods were the only way to create a better world. Even though it meant that life was an illusion and because suffering was inevitable, living in the illusion was the only way to make peace actually happen. He was willing to do this, even if it meant creating war. As we can see, there have been many attempts of characters in the real world and in fiction to try and mold the world in their way and try to change the world in a way which is in congruence with their philosophies and the way they see the world. Only through personal principles and morality can we attempt to justify whether one's aims are forged in a good or evil basis. Meaning that trying to judge something as good or evil is purely subjective. What is important is the context do you kill one person to spare three others? Practically, you would agree, as logic dictates that killing one person is better than killing three people. However, regardless of the outcome, is killing that one person an evil deed? Absolutely, you would argue yes, but relatively, it gets a little bit more complex. Do the ends truly justify the means? Is it right to subscribe to the idea that committing a lesser evil is necessary to prevent the greater evil? And such evil is on a scale? Or is evil absolute and, and committing any of it makes you become such? Again, I don't have the answers for this question, but it is food for thought. In this scenario, I would point you to some of the most famous quotes by Friedrich Nietzsche. There is no such thing as moral phenomena, but only a moral interpretation of phenomena. He who fights with monsters might take care lest he become a monster. And if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. In order to defeat the monsters, we must become the monster. In, or in order to prevent evil, we will inevitably commit the same evil along the way. This leads us to another important question. What sort of person is capable of doing this effectively and what must he or she do to actually achieve it? In this video, we'll focus on Lelouch v Britannia from Code Geass. Let's go, one of my favorite characters of all time. You can't see it, but. And we're gonna be doing a breakdown of his character and looking into his psychology. We will determine the sort of person that he is and how his characteristics and his plans were compulsory in changing the world in the way that he did. We will look into the psychology of Lelouch, the man with the plan. <laughs> Until I met you, I was dead. An impotent corpse existing behind a false guise of life. A life in which I did nothing real. Day to day, I merely went through the motions of living, as if I were a zombie, and I always had the feeling that I was gradually dying. If I'm condemned to go back to that, then I'd rather... Stop it! <laughs> the way a person is, is not something I believe is completely fixed. I think we start with a basic set of qualities which improve and change for our, our lifetime. In the world of psychology and academia, there are two main measurements for personality types. You have the Myers-Briggs and you have the Big Five personality test. this video, I'll be using the Big Five to assess Lelouch and his traits. So I've watched Code Geass a fair, amount, a fair amount of times and I've got a pretty good idea of where he would be on the scales. The problem here is that he embodies another persona known as Zero, which isn't as exactly the same as Lelouch, but I'll use the version of him that talks to C2 as the main 
as the main personality for Measure because I believe that is his truest form. And he actually has three altogether. So Lelouch v Britannia, Lelouch Lamperouge and Zero. And only a few of them know multiple, but only, only C2 really knows all three. Zero is the identity he assumes when he's leading his military force, the Black Knights. And they have no idea who he is. Some characters know overlaps of Lelouch's personalities, like Suzaku knows Lelouch Lamperouge and Lelouch, Lelouch v Britannia, but doesn't know Zero. Uh, none of them knows uh, Lelouch v Britannia and Lelouch Lamperouge. And Carlin later in the series knows Zero and Lelouch, v uh, Lelouch Lamperouge. So it's a bit, not too complicated, but you get the picture, right? So his internal monologues and conversations with C2 will be the main measure for measuring his personality. The Big Five personality test consists of five traits um, to be used as the acronym known as OCEAN, standing for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Almost forgot that. <laughs> openness to experience is one's overall spontaneity, openness to experience, and just general, just general openness to new things and experiences. Oh, and change. I think I said that already. Those high in this area are open-minded and imaginative compared to those in low openness to experience. They tend to be a little bit more narrow-minded and a bit more literal. In the case of Lelouch, I would argue that he's very high in creativeness and intelligence and openness as well. For this, I point you to his chess ability. Chess perfectly illustrates Lelouch, Lelouch's creativity and intelligence. His skills in the actual game are superb, but he is able to apply these strategies within the context of a war. His openness allows him to improvise and adapt to his opponent's strategies, evident in the case of the battle with Shinke and Clovis. Shinke of the Chinese Liberation, I believe. Oh, Federation. Federation. Not only is he able to win in a large majority of cases, but he is also able to win at a disadvantage and convincingly. According to Jordan Peterson, highly open individuals are more likely to be very creative and very intelligent. Or can be, not always. In this case, Lelouch's creativity is evident in his performances or inventions or artworks or, or, or what have you. We'll go over the dimensions in the middle in a minute. Or you could also define it as the proclivity to engage in creative thought. And I think we'll start with that first. So what does it mean to think creatively? It's, it's sort of like, it's something like this. You imagine that I toss you out an idea, and there's some probability that when I toss you that idea that that will trigger off other ideas in your imagination. So you could think about it as a threshold issue. If you're not very creative, I'll throw you an idea, and hardly any other ideas will be triggered. And the ones that will be triggered are going to be very closely associated with that initial idea. Thanks to creativity, Lelouch, Lelouch can think his way out of very difficult situations, like in the case of Mao, the chess game. Mao was able to read Lelouch's mind, so he was inevitably able to think, to able to read what Lelouch had planned ahead. In response, Lelouch used Gias on himself before the chess match to forget the plan so that when Mao was reading his mind, he couldn't actually decipher the plan. Good stuff. People with high conscientiousness tend to be very self-aware, future-focused and hard-working and can be pretty organized too. These people are better at delaying gratification for the prospect of long-term success. Simply put, orderliness and industriousness. Making very detailed structured plans and having the diligence to actually carry them out. Those of you that watch Code Geass know that this criteria is very, very, very abundant in Lelouch. That's why I would say that he's very high in conscientiousness. Probably like 99 or 100%. I feel like he's just pure conscientiousness. Maybe a little bit lower, 95, you see what I mean. And here's why. We all know from the Zero Rec Room, his final plan, all his actions led up to that final moment. All of the people that he killed and all of the battles that he went through led up to his final inevitable death. In a nutshell, Lelouch's plan was to become the most powerful, most hated dictator in the world of an empire which controlled the world. He strived to become the most powerful man and the most hated. The purpose of this was to unite a previously divided world via joint ambition and unity to take down Lelouch. This is Gara said to the allied shinobi forces. Between those who have experienced the same pain, there can be no hate. Lelouch's self-awareness comes into play when we think of all the actions he had to take to achieve his aim. In order to become the monster that everyone hated, in effect he needed to become the monster at least 99% and keep 1% of his humanity back. The reason why he did it. World peace. If he became completely consumed by his power, he would have failed the plan, and his self-awareness kept him on a greater purpose to actually achieve his goal. I made a video where I compared Light and Lelouch, and pretty much what I said there is that Lelouch had the self-awareness that Light didn't, and because Light didn't have the self-awareness, he used the Death Note for selfish reasons and ended up getting completely consumed by it. Whereas with Lelouch, he used the Gias for selfless reasons and didn't have any really ego involved in it and he ended up succeeding. Even though Lelouch's goal was paved and 
forged with blood. Ultimately, it was a selfless goal because he paid, and he also paid the price of his own choosing. The third trait is extroversion. An extrovert person is someone that quite likes to be the center of attention and is generally quite outgoing. Someone in low extrovertedness is known as an introvert. These people tend to prefer working in solitude and like working alone. With Lelouch, I would class him much more as an introvert than an extrovert. Despite the fact that he is the center of attention when he's zero on the world stage, he's not really being himself, but he's acting as a symbol of revolution. Throughout Code Geass, Lelouch confides only in C2 and tells no one else about his plans. He keeps everything a secret, his identity, his plans, and this is so he can ensure that he can carry out his plans without anyone else getting in the way and keeping everyone safe. I would say that Lelouch is quite comfortable with these methods for the most part, as he is portrayed as quite aloof and reserved even before receiving the gear. This leads me to believe that his introverted nature actually complements his plan, as well as his privacy and confidentiality, and these are essential if he needs to achieve his mission. He does have the ability to socialize well and has the charisma to lead an army, but just because he's naturally introverted doesn't mean that he can't display some extroverted traits. Lelouch is an introverted genius with the qualities of a leader. Now, agreeableness is how well someone gets along with others. This includes, but isn't limited to, kindness and altruism. This one is difficult to assess as arguments could be made for either. On one hand, Lelouch is agreeable because he sets out to have plans to create a better world for his sister Nunley to live in, and then the world, of course, and he cooperates with others as Zero to achieve this. However, because of all the evil he commits and all the people he hurts and murders, I would argue that Lelouch is is very low on the agreeableness spectrum, especially because he isn't convinced by anyone else as means of changing the world. Like his father's Ragnarok connection, creating a world free of change, or Suzaku's method of changing the system slowly from within. Lastly, we have neuroticism, and this is basically the tendency to experience negative emotions like fear, worry, and anxiety as well. The higher the level of neuroticism, the higher the tendency to experience negative emotions. Those low in neuroticism are generally calm, emotionally stable, level-headed, and optimistic, and they can keep calm in very stressful situations. Based on how calm and collected Lelouch is during the series, I would judge him as very low in neuroticism. An example of this is when Lelouch accidentally used Gios on Euphemia to kill all the Japanese, or Elevens, so she ended up killing all of them without him even wanting that to happen, which is a pretty panic scenario, it's a pretty bad scenario, right? And this, of course, wasn't according to Lelouch's plan and was a very traumatic event. His main purpose was to create a world where those weaker, those without power, were gonna benefit, but he ended up killing a lot of them. Instead of completely freaking out, Lelouch turns the situation into his advantage, as sickening as it was for him to do so. Throughout Kogias, Lelouch has been in many stressful situations like this. The biggest occasion of this is when Lelouch lost it, when he fought Nunnally, Nunnally died during the final battle and he completely abandoned everything like everything but this is understandable though because at this point in the series to him Nunnally was the only reason why he was doing all this stuff it was pretty crazy which is why later in the series he sort of changed his perspective he sort of changed his idea on the plan but again this was his top priority so this reaction albeit a bit mad kind of made sense. In summary of Lelouch's personality, he is quite high in openness, conscientiousness, and low on extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. A determined introvert genius who sought out to change the world by destroying it and creating a new one. Not only smile was her way of expressing gratitude. You're laboring under a delusion. I will not let you call that a lie. Over my dead body, your refusal to face reality Content to watch us from afar. Don't make me laugh. There's only one truth here. You, my own parents, you abandoned us! <sighs> the world of Code Geass is based on an alternative timeline where Britannia actually owns a third of the world. I'm have to double check that. Might be a bit more. And the countries as we know them become dominions of the empire. So Japan, instead of being called Japan, gets called Area 11. And other areas be called Area 7 or Area 6. You get the picture. Consequently, those Japanese people were known as 11s. And they'd live in poorer conditions. They'd basically be second class citizens living in... 
living in ghettos, they were raided by Britannian soldiers and the Japanese were killed. And the philosophy of the Britannians is that the strong must devour the weak. This is a world ruled by superficiality, nobility, and of course, an iron fist. Lelouch lives in this world, and he is actually one of the princes of the Britannian Empire. And he lives with his sister in Area 11, Japan. After being banished by his father after giving up his claim to the throne, following his mother's death and his sister's cripplement. And she became crippled due to a traumatic incident which led her to be blind and she couldn't walk. Now, Nanali is a kind-hearted and loving person and treats everyone with compassion. But unfor unfortunately though, she's confined to a wheelchair. And Lelouch loves her and he loves her greatly, enough to change the world for her. Unfortunately though, due to Britannia's kind of ideas about weakness, she isn't fit to live in this world. And this is the reason why, initially, Lelouch seeks to change this world. A world he deems to be corrupt and unjust. One could say that Britannia fully embraces the idea of social Darwinism. And according to History.com, Social Darwinists believe in the survival of the fittest. The idea that certain people become powerful in society because they are innately better. Social Darwinism has been used to justify imperialism, racism, eugenics and social inequality at various times over the past century and a half. <sighs> Based on Lelouch's experience of being an outcast, his mother killed and his sister crippled as a result, and this in accordance with him feeling like he's done nothing with his life and hasn't been living, I can relate to that to an extent. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine, when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Rather, he was living a lie. The perfect fuel for Lelouch to start his rebellion. Our father. Charles Z. Britannia, the 98th Emperor, no longer lives, and I'm the one who took his life. Huh? Therefore, that makes me the next emperor. What are you saying? Are you nuts? Guards, take that fool and execute him! He's guilty of murdering our emperor! Shizaku! Now, I strongly believe that no man can truly understand himself without the presence of others, it's just a reflection. And I believe the only way we can gain a deeper knowledge of ourselves is through interactions with other people. Especially because, now get this, different versions of us exist in everyone we know. So there's no real one version of us. It's pretty crazy when you think of it that way. We have evolved to need relationships to survive because those who are left out the tribes were the ones to die out. Who is Lelouch Lamprouge? Who is Zero? Who is Lelouch V Britannia? To some, a longtime friend. To others, a brother, a student, a lover, an accomplice, to a savior. The relationships that Lelouch has are dynamic and have very different representations. His sister Nanli represents all that's good in the world and something that needs to be cherished and his reason for starting his journey and pushing him along to go this far, to go as far as he does to change the world. She represents purity, hope and future. Suzaku is Lelouch's oldest friend and at odds with him philosophically. They are both two sides of the same coin. They want the same result with very different means. He represents open-mindedness, naivety, and self-righteousness. The Black Knights are Lelouch's slash Zero's military force. He knows each of them personally and all their stories as any great any great leader should. Yet they know nothing about him. Zero is able to lead them throughout the rebellion with his charisma. They represent strength, camaraderie, and determination. His school friends, Rivel, Millie, and Shirley, are the people around him during his time at school and lightheartedness and peace. Times of lightheartedness light and peace. They represent peace, wholesomeness, and fun. Like the time when they lit the fireworks together. And they are glimpses of the future that Lelouch is fighting for can look like. C2 is his accomplice and is the only one that knows about his turmoil and his plans. And she's the one who gave Lelouch his gear. She's the only one that witnessed his emotional pain throughout the story. She represents truth, nihilism, and change. These representations of each relationship with Lelouch demonstrate different elements of his psyche. All of them know parts of him, but never the full whole. The other members of the cast serve as reflection of different parts of Lelouch's personality. We know that Lelouch loves and cares for those around him. That's what makes him self-aware. That's what makes him human. He knows that he must be willing to lose whatever's closest to him in order to achieve his plan, which is world peace. Hear me, Britannia! All you who have power, heed my words carefully. I am burdened by sorrow, <laughs> war and discrimination, malicious deeds carried out by the strong, the same abhorrent interplay of tragedy and comedy. The world has not changed. The people still suffer. That is why the resurrection of Zero was necessary. A symbol is something that represents something for something else, especially a material object representing something abstract. 
A symbol can be represented by a, an idea or a concept. When Lelouch puts on the Zero Mask, he's no longer a man. He becomes Zero, a walking icon of and representation of an idea, the idea of revolution. Not only this, but Zero serves as a beacon of hope for all those that have been neglected or abandoned or, or hurt by Britannia, those who've had their loved ones and livelihoods destroyed. He stands out even more because no one have ch challenged Britannia in such a menacing way before. He appears as the definitive symbol of justice and change. For Arco Gias, the idea of Zero becomes more clear as he cooperates with different federations in order to gain more trust and support from the public, or anyone that isn't Britannian. Due to the fact that Zero is a symbol and not a person, he can live indefinitely even though even after the host has perished, being Lelouch in this case. After the death of Lelouch, Sazarko upholds the mantle, resuming the will of Zero and what he exists to be, a protector for those without power. Given this, Zero was birthed from Lelouch's ideal, and from this we can discern more about Lelouch's philosophy and his psychology. He is a very selfless individual with very good understanding of the world and how it works, and he understands there will always be those with power and always those lacking it. He's not naive enough to believe that his actions, although very consequential, will create permanent and everlasting change. He learned this from his father's mistake with the Ragnarok, Ragnarok connection. Trying to create a world with no peace and trying to create a world with no change and permanent peace. Having the idea of Zero ensures that there will always be a saviour there in, in case things inevitably get corrupt again. It's just the nature of people, right? And it poses the question of whether true peace can even be achieved. Because if done so, then the world becomes a world full of lies and masks, right? Very similar to Madara's project Suki no Mi to me. Just like Zero, we all wear masks and sometimes they're necessary and we need these things to get on with others and progress as a species and that's how we work collaboratively. If we never wore masks and we were all ourselves all the time, we'd just always be at loggerheads together. Like we would never get on. We'd never get anything done. And this gives us an insight into Lelouch's maturity, his foresight and most importantly his self-awareness. I love you, little sister. You used your geass on me, didn't you? Come back! Personally, I think one of the most beautiful things of, about Lelouch is his humanity. Despite all the bad things he does, he never completely loses himself along the way. In the end, he's still an, a caring older brother who wanted to change the world so that his sister could live happily in it. Lelouch is a very complex character due to his many masks, and I think the key to its significance is its dramatic irony. I irony, 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 I irony. Kogias does an excellent job in making us feel connected to Lelouch, similar to the way C2 feels. This is because we have a better understanding of Lelouch compared to the other members of the cast. We know what's going on behind the scenes. As I stated earlier, apart from C2, none of the characters know Lelouch v Britannia, Zero, and the Lelouch Lamp Rouge all at once. And us as viewers sit in the middle of the Venn diagram. This carries up all the way up even to the very end. <laughs> because once everyone does know about Lelouch's true identity, we become like the rest of the cast. We don't understand why Lelouch says or does what he does. We don't understand his actions or what the Zero Requiem even is. And because of this, some, some viewers might have actually sided against Lelouch during this time in the series. However, once it's revealed what the Zero Requiem even is, we are connected to Lelouch once again and Lelouch's solitude. The effect of this is massive, especially in the last half of the show, as Lelouch is lonelier than he's ever been. After the Black Knights find out about Lelouch's true identity, they turn against him. Oh, and Gias as well. He is then saved by Rolo and someone that is fantasized by the idea about Lelouch being his older brother, and so he ends up sacrificing his life to save him. And also, at this point in the series 2, C2 has lost her memory. The person he was closest with, he couldn't even talk to about his plan. His true, his closest and only confidant was gone, making Lelouch well and truly alone. Now, only us, the viewers, are left to guess what Lelouch's plan is and how it all ends. I believe it was this point in the show that Lelouch sort of made up what his final plan was going to be. Perhaps it was the isolation that made it easier for him to get everyone to turn against him. And I guess it makes sense. And before this point, he was revered by many. But it's as C2 said, the power of the king makes one live a life of loneliness. I destroy the world. And create it. And no. Lelouch is one of my favorite characters in anime and maybe even in fiction. I mean, have a look. Woo! My guy, my guy, my guy. Despite his character flaws, he stands as a testament of self awareness, um, which is 
are completely essential in our lives. Without knowing the reasons why we're doing what we are doing, and having the conscientiousness and foresight to recognize that our labors will bear fruit, we will struggle to achieve anything we set out. Lelouch knew that changing the world would mean he'd have to do despicable things. He knew it. He knew he'd have to kill people and even sacrifice his own well-being. He did all of this to die as a villain. When in reality, he, he planned on becoming the villain so that all the hatred could be f like forced onto him and then peace would flow outward. <laughs> This is very similar to another one of my favorite characters, being Itachi Uchiha from Naruto. Another who sacrificed his life for the greater good and becoming a villain in the process. In this regard, Lelouch's actions are purely for the benefit of others, with absolutely no ego attached to it. He didn't care for having statues or having a positive legacy behind him. Being banished by his father and holding a massive burning grudge towards Britannia, Lelouch had the drive and ambition to change a world that he deemed to be fundamentally evil. Unfortunately, before he got the gear, Lelouch lived like a zombie and didn't have the power to do anything about it. His intelligence and creativity were the perfect basis to channel his power and qualify towards the chess game on a global stage and even win. As the series went on, Lelouch lost a lot of people. People he loved and he, he didn't have a lot of humanity left in him. The relationships that he lost from, were a reminder of how isolated he truly was. As soon as Lelouch accepted the contract, he knew what was coming. A life of loneliness and isolation. All the sacrifices meant he could start over again and create a new world. On compassionate footing with Suzaku as the new Zero. With Suzaku forging ahead as the next host of Zero. And meaning there will be someone for a rebellion next time the time comes. So guys, I hope you enjoyed my psychology of Lelouch video. Um, I really enjoyed making it. I'm going to make more types of these videos in the future of sort of breakdown, long analysis, but I kind of like doing my self-improvement-esque sort of videos as well with like different anime topics, sort of lessons you can gain through these shows. I'm sort of going to like focus things on that as well. Uh, I've got a few ideas for new videos. If you have any suggestions, let me know. But please like, subscribe, comment and all that stuff. Uh, I've been Sir Lance and have a great day. Adrenaline pumping through my veins, now I'm feeling the thrill Call me Itachi, you won't see me, Tsukuyomi Underneath